the tenants that we thought we were going to get in 2018 are very different if for phase two than what we're actually uh, securing today, right? I mean, we've got a lube shop, we've got a cannabis, we've got a liquor store, we have a gas station. Uh, the these are. Hey, investors, Bradley here from Watson Estates, and you're listening to the largest, fastest growing podcast for Toronto real estate on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Today, we've got a very special guest on the show, and I want to speak to a very specific type of person. If this is you, you do not want to miss this interview. I'm talking to the type of person that's maybe a doctor, engineer, maybe you're self-employed, or you have some other occupation that generates a relatively significant amount of income. And you found that the residential space as you've been investing has really only helped you in the form of appreciation, but you haven't been able to get free from that tight squeeze, right? You're working hard and hard and hard in order to generate that income, but really never experiencing true wealth. Well, if that's you, you do not want to miss this conversation I had today with Shane Melanson. He's a commercial developer in Calgary, Alberta, and I want him to change the way you think about investing in real estate today. He's got more than $70 million in real estate projects under his belt. He's helped his clients buy and sell more than a quarter billion dollars of commercial real estate. We talk in retail, industrial, multifamily, whatever that looks like. He's the host of The Investing Advantage and the author of the book, Club Syndication, How the Wealthy Raise Capital and Invest in commercial real estate. Today, that's exactly what we're talking about. How do you convert that income into cash flow and be able to replace the money you've been making in your career to get free, to unlock those chains and break through? If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our channel and enjoy the show. Shane, thank you for joining us on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Bradley. Good to be here. Yes, I'm very excited because I think you're able to speak to a very niche category of some of our listeners here in the GTA, uh, as we get started here, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and um, where you specialize in the real estate world. Sure. So today I'm a commercial real estate developer and investor, and uh, I'm based here in Calgary, but I've invested across Canada. Uh, specifically, one of our big developments was in Muskoka, uh, just outside Gravenhurst and Bracebridge. So familiar with the GTA area, and I've also been in the US. So that's where I'm at today. But I started probably like a lot of people investing in residential uh, real estate. And um, I don't know, like we can go back to kind of why I got into investing, why I got into real estate. Uh, that That's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you. I mean, sometimes we can just jump right into deals or if you want, I can kind of. Well, we'll get there. We'll get into some examples because I want to hear some real world scenarios for your clients and today yeah. where you're at. But I do think it's important we take a second just to take a breather because I do believe, at least from the interactions I've had with a lot of our listeners, is they tend to start in the residential space. I think it's a very safe and easy way to go. So I think having that is really going to show that you haven't always been doing these multi-million dollar deals and yeah. that you built up to that. So maybe give us a little bit of context on so maybe some of the markets you've come through and, and how you've built to, to get there. Sure. So in 03, I graduated uh, from U of C and I, one of my good buddies actually at the time, I was, I was living in his basement. I was saving lots of money because uh, my paradigm at that time was I was very distrusting. Uh, I saw my parents at 19 lose about hundred thousand dollars. They refinanced their house. They're both teachers uh, because they trusted the wrong person and invested in the wrong deal. So, you know, I thought I'm just going to save money and I'm going to hoard it, right? And so when you're 22, 23, and you've got, you know, kind of a good five figures in the bank, that seemed like a good thing. But I was starting to see, you know, my buddies specifically, he was a bartender and he owned five houses. And so he invited me to a rain event. And it was the first time that I kind of got exposed to what was possible in real estate. So after the event, I went out, bought my own house. I guess it's called house hacking now. I got a friend that kind of rented from me. A couple of months later, I went out and bought a fix and flip. I had no frigging clue what I was doing, but I, I kind of you know figured my way through it. And then I started to do more and more deals. And as people started to see, wow, Shane's actually doing real estate. Can I partner with you? Essentially joint ventures, right? Yeah. They would put up a lot of the money. I'd put up some of the money. We'd both go on and get the mortgage. And so I was doing fix and flips. Then I started to get into buy and hold. Then I went into spec homes. And this is kind of in a short span of about 04 to 2007. Yeah. And as I started to get more and more capital coming in, um, I started to want to do bigger deals. I had this, this sense, like if I had money in the bank, it was losing me money, right? 
because right. I could go out and get maybe 10 or 12 or 15% or 25. Like, I mean, some of the deals I was doing were, were quite lucrative, right? Cause you could, you could turn them pretty quick. Um, for context, I was single, right? I mean, I might, I was dating, but uh, I didn't have kids. And so I wasn't focused on uh, passive income. I was focused on generating as much net worth as possible. And so what I was doing is I was taking probably more risk than I should have. And as we know, in 07, 08, things started to change. I had money in the wrong deals. Uh, I got you know squeezed out of a couple. I lost 250,000 in a single deal. And you know that's when I started to pivot and uh, forced, right? Like not because I, I was I sat back, but it was like, okay, I just had to sell my house, my X5. And I was no longer uh, this, uh, what I had kind of pictured, you know, the real estate guru or not guru, but like um, mogul, right? right? I was, I was, um, you know, I was human and, and uh, definitely uh, learning some expensive lessons. So about that time, uh, my fiance at the time, uh, her dad is a fairly prominent real estate developer. Uh, their family company has been around for about 97, 98 years publicly traded. Anyways, he, uh, I, I got to know him over the years and he said, why don't you come down with me on a trip? I'm going to California, I'm going to Texas to look at some properties. And all I knew was that he was kind of a big deal, but I didn't really know kind of how he invested and what he looked for in real estate. And so on the trip was kind of my first exposure into the commercial real estate, right? Multifamily, uh, we looked at a lot of office buildings. We looked at some retail, some industrial, and I was, I was a little out of my wheelhouse because at the time I was a lender in commercial real estate. So I, I wasn't uh, naive to it, but it's a very big difference between actually touring as if you're going to be a buyer versus being a lender. And so that was kind of how I got into it. And we can kind of jump off wherever you want to go from there. Well, I, I want to, because we have a lot of listeners here that I know are, are deep in the residential space. And, and I know if they're anything like me, when we start talking about retail, industrial, it's just like, whoa, or where are we going here? <laughs> and, and I really hope for those who haven't changed the channel and they're, they're really tuned in here, I really want you to get, go dive deep because you, you've really described what I think had hit a lot of people before 2008. And this description of losing money in the bank is more real than ever today, way more than back then. So could you just... I'm curious to see the difference, this learning curve you've seen between what does a typical, even someone making a lot of money from the nine to five, multiple jobs, maybe high income. Yeah. What is the difference between that person and someone who is truly wealthy? Like what does the wealthy person do when they're looking at their real estate portfolio? So uh, I think the wealthy person, uh, because I, I work with a lot of investors uh, that, that earn very high income, right? Mid six figures. And what became, what, what, what I found very interesting was they're on a treadmill still, right? If they don't show up, that source of revenue stops and they typically have one, maybe two sources of revenue. And usually when we start to kind of dive into their portfolios, even if they own real estate, a lot of them have residential real estate. So I can think of a couple, even in the GTA, right? They might have two, three, $4 million of quote unquote net worth. And I say, okay, well, what is your, like how much passive income, how much, and, and initially they're kind of like, well, what do you mean? Or I'll say, well, what kind of <laughs> cash on cash return are you getting? And they're like, well, I'm getting this. And I'm like, okay, so like, but once we dive deep, it's actually not cash on cash. What they're getting is equity appreciation. Right. So their property went up 10%. So I've got a, you know, a, let's just say a million dollars. It went up 10%. I made a hundred thousand dollars. Well, unless you either refinance that or sell that property, you don't really actually get to use that money, right? It doesn't allow you to get away from your job. And look, I'm not big on necessarily, um, uh, you know, the word retirement, it's more of a choice, right? Like I still work, but I'm in my house. Uh, I take my kids to school. I go golfing when I want to, I, I mountain bike, but I still work, right? But it's on my terms and, and it's something that I, I, I really enjoy doing. So I think the wealthy, what they have is um, they're not lazy, they still work, but they are doing things uh, on their terms and they're hypersensitive about their time. So they will, like I learned a lot of this just being around my father-in-law. And I remember having conversations with him around time and money. And, uh, and it was just a very big, 
paradigm shift versus my parents who were teachers, right? Because they worked until they could get a pension and now they, they have a, you know, comfortable life. Um, but they had to, uh, I mean, they, they committed 35 years in order to get that. And, and I don't know if there's as many people these days that are, uh, at least that I'm, I'm aware of, I'm in my forties that are thinking that they're going to have a pension when they retire. And so like, what is it that's going to provide for you and your family? If, for example, you can't work or you no longer want to work or obviously with COVID, um, you know, a lot of people have been laid off. Right. And I, and I have a lot of people that are coming in now saying, Shane, how do I create a second source of revenue? How do I create uh, additional streams of revenue where my time is no longer required. You know, I don't have to be there working to, to do that. I, I can tell who your clientele is just from the way you describe that. Cause that that's bang on that. That is really the, that's the dilemma of the high income earner, right? Is they're, yeah. they're making a lot of money. They love that, but they also feel poor in the sense of time. They're yeah. putting so much into it. And, and so I think that what you're speaking to is a very real challenge for a lot of folks. I also totally agree that people investing in the GTA, specifically in the city of Toronto, are focused directly on appreciation. They say, I want to invest because I want cash flow. That's the first thing they say. But what they find five, 10 years down the road is really all they've been making their money on has been significant is appreciation. Yeah. So I, I love the approach that you take in your business and, and guiding people to that cash flow position. I think that's extremely important, especially as an income replacement. And, and the higher that income is, the higher the replacement requirement. And so really that speaks to, to starting early, but I, I want to jump into some of these different categories. Okay. Sure. So I know you're, you're focused in retail, which and industrial, and maybe as we're going through these, why you like each category and maybe what impacts have, have happened during COVID, like what changes have you seen in those markets? And maybe you're leaning towards one category or another today. Yeah. Well, um, so that, that's a, uh, a good question because, uh, I don't think that there's one strategy that works for everybody. And because markets are cyclical, things change, right? So when I started my retail development in 2018, it was like, that was where people wanted to be. We had a very clear uh, runway on tenants and exiting that deal, or we could continue to keep it. Well, fast forward, I don't think anybody would have predicted what would, what, you know, happened. And we've still been able to, um, uh, execute on our game plan, find tenants and fill it up. But the tenants that we thought we were going to get in 2018 are very different if for phase two than we have for um, th than what we're actually uh, securing today, right? I mean, we've got a lube shop, we've got a cannabis, we've got a liquor store, we have a gas station. Uh, the these are, yeah, <laughs> essentials, and they're not going to be uh, shut down, you know, either due to COVID or uh, right. impacted as much by e commerce. So those are important. Uh, if you were to ask me, Shane, are you going to continue to do retail deals? In a very select case, I would. Uh, but it's usually because one of my key principles of investing is I take risk out of the deal. So mm -hmm. every one of my deals, I'm, I'm getting either anchor tenants or pre-sales or pre-leasing well in advance so that I, I have certainty before I go into a deal. So that's, we'll just kind of put that out there. Industrial, uh, I really like industrial. Uh, I, I think that there's, there's lots of reasons. I mean, obviously right now you're, you're seeing a big run up in industrial properties and real estate. I mean, in the GTA, you're yeah. 2 million bucks an acre for land, like land, like not even, um, you know, with a building on it. And I think it's because, well, there's a few different reasons, but some of the reasons I like industrial are you know, you still have to get goods and serve goods to people, right? And so they typically have to go from point A to point B. Uh, supply chain is is changing uh, constantly. I wouldn't say that I'm an expert at industrial. I have very good people around me. And so that's one of the other things that I'm kind of hyper-focused on is really making sure that I've got a good team, right? I, I, I do understand multifamily. Uh, I do understand retail and industrial, but more than that, I've got a really good kind of bench uh, around me to kind of fill in some of the gaps. So, um, and I mean, we can talk about multifamily because that's probably, I mean, multi is really where a lot of residential investors, that's kind of what they springboard into because there's not as much of a learning curve. Yeah. And, and we have had a lot of multi, so maybe we won't get too deep into how the multifamily process sure. works, but it sounds as though you're, you're kind of leaning that way these days. It sounds like I'm seeing major 
like REITs and stuff moving even into the US, I'm seeing these massive shifts from people in other countries investing in single family, multifamily properties that never typically have because of the opportunities there. But all of those, I appreciate you taking time on the other ones because I, I don't know or haven't spoken to too many in the retail industrial. And I think just having that open mind to those avenues and being able to pivot with a team like yours, I think is important. So now let, let's talk about what are some of the struggles um, that you see some of these investors have as they're trying to create wealth. They're trying to go from a high income to a high cash flow and wealth building freedom of time. What are some of the challenges they're facing? Uh, I think a few of the challenges are where do I start, right? Just understanding some of the terminology and language of commercial real estate. Yeah. So uh, I, I have a podcast as well. And I had a few individuals on, on stock option trading, right? Cause I wanted to just understand what it was. And I could tell very quickly that because I didn't speak the language, I got lost when they were talking about puts and calls and, and you know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm curious I, who your guest was. Uh, well, I had two of them. Uh, I had, um, Cody. Yay. Yes. So uh, I thought you sound like you're talking to Cody. We had Cody yeah. actually on our podcast as well. Yeah. And Cody, he actually did a really good job. Like both of the uh, individuals, cause I also had Omar on as well. And, um, both guys really smart. It's just, if you're unfamiliar with that world, then the language itself can be a barrier. It's almost like someone is speaking a, a different language. And then, so you get lost uh, so quickly. And so True. I have to sometimes take a step back because a lot of my clients might be uh, physicians or engineers and they're, they're very smart and they've done very well. But as soon as you enter into a new realm, it's kind of like, what is a triple net lease? What's a cap rate? What's a debt coverage ratio or DCR? And, you know, it's easy to throw out these acronyms, but if you lose someone, then they, they close off or they, you know, you, you don't want to make someone feel um, uh, either stupid or that they don't understand what's going on. But, you know, you've, so just taking the time to kind of educate someone into kind of what I call the game of investing in commercial real estate, really what to look for, what are the risks, um, I think who to trust, like that has been one of my, um, one of the reasons I put out a lot of information because in the world of commercial real estate, there's not as many people that have been at this for a long time, uh, that are sharing that. I think more, uh, today than when I started a couple of years back, but, um, the reality is my father-in-law, the people that are operating at like a really high level, like in the billions, I mean, they don't have podcasts. They don't have books. They're, they're like too busy doing what, what they do. And, and for them, it doesn't make sense because they don't need uh, the extra exposure. Uh, for me, it's a bit of a different story because I'm growing my brand. And as I do that, I see more deal flow and I see more capital. So it's a, you know, it, it's mutually beneficial. The more people I help, the more people that, you know, it, uh, uh, it works for both sides. Uh, but specifically to your question, I think that, just knowing the game is so key and, uh, and finding the right people um, is huge. I could show you two pro formas. Um, and unless you really understood the market, it, it would be, it would be, it would be virtually impossible to know whether or not it's BS or if it's true, right? Uh, because you can financially engineer a model to spit out whatever numbers you want, right? And, and it really comes down to the assumptions and the track record and the team and uh, what I call like blue sky optimism versus, you know, taking a more conservative approach, so. Absolutely. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, so, so you've got this obvious a, a balance right now and there's a raising capital aspect to this. So, so let's not assume anybody has the money just sitting there in, in order to purchase the type of building or facility that, they, that they're looking for. Sure. How do they do that? What is that? What is that transition from, you know what, I, I'm, I'm open to learning, but I want to make sure if I'm going to go through the, the aspects of learning that I know that there's a platform for me to raise that capital. How have you been able to do that yourself and your clients that you've coached? What is a common method for that? So the way that you're going to see a lot of, uh, even the wealthiest uh, people invest in commercial real estate is done in syndications, right? Where they basically, there's a group of people that pool their money together. And so the book that I wrote club syndication, it's on, um, you know, raising capital and you can come into it one of two ways, right? So let's say you understand the game and you know how to find properties. 
you could become what's called the general partner or the person that goes out, sources the deal. And then you have a group of limited partners or maybe doctors or engineers or business owners that are too busy to go find the deal that have um, uh, income or money that they want to place. And they, they're called limited partners because their risk is limited to the amount of money they put into the deal. Okay, so I'll give you an example. So the deal, the development I'm doing right now, right after this, I'm going to meet our, our banker uh, or sorry, our lawyer to sign off on the mortgage documents. And on there, the reason I have to meet with my lawyer is because I'm signing personal guarantees. Okay, so my house is on the line as are my personal assets. My limited partners, they don't have any exposure to that. Okay, so if they put $100,000, that's the maximum that they could lose. For me, obviously, it could be, you know, significantly more. And that's why I'm, I'm you know, uh, very careful in the type of deals I do, because I don't want to expose my family to any undue risk. So you can either come into it actively or passively. And I mean, you can participate in these deals. I would say as a rule of thumb, probably like 50 grand is probably like on the low end. I know you can get into deals for 25 and 10, but um, my personal beliefs, right? This doesn't mean it's the right thing. It's just how I view it. That if you're coming in with less than 50, because you're investing in, in an illiquid asset, it may not be the best avenue for you know, the, the type of, like for me, I, I probably wouldn't have investors. Like my minimums are 50 and most people are coming in for more than that. Um, uh, and, and like I said, I, I've got various reasons for that, but if you've got cash, you can come in actively or passively. And I would say a hundred thousand is probably a good benchmark. Uh, and then what type of returns you get is going to be based on the level of risk, the type of deal, obviously a development, more risk. So we're going to get higher returns. If you're buying like a cash flowing, maybe a small value add, the returns are going to be a little bit, a little bit less, but your risk profile is, is vastly different. So I think asking those two questions, one, do you want to be active or passive Two, what are your risk uh, or what are your return expectations? And as you're speaking, it's, it's reminded me of deals has been, that's been dropped in my lap where I've looked at it and you're like, you know what, these numbers look really good, but the person that's delivered the deal mm. was enough of a reason to not go ahead. Because just, be, you know, and it's really, as you're kind of talking, it's reminding me of circumstances that I've seen. So I can totally see that, but I love that the, the limited, the limited partnership side. I think that's great that you described the, the syndicate too. So for that's maybe a new term for some folks, but it's definitely done. It's quite a common approach to, to doing this. So uh, we've been dancing a little bit about some of these examples, but could you give us an example of one of your, your high income clients and what they've been able to accomplish investing sure. um, in, in the recent past? So um, one guy that kind of comes to mind and, and it's really why I got into the coaching world, if you will, because I, I do have my real estate brokerage license. And so I, I you know, uh, in, in a previous life, I used to do a lot more of that. Uh, but most of our clients were like pension funds, REITs, uh, wealthy families. And so they generally had teams. And as a broker, just like this goes into the game, right? So anybody that's listening, they, they can, they'll get a kind of a glimpse into the world of commercial real estate. Very different than residential real estate, where you have maybe two brokers and, you know, let's say you're going and buying your buy side broker that's representing you is really there to kind of hold your hand, protect you. In the world of commercial real estate, there's usually one agent, not always, but I'm just going to say, you know, generally speaking, especially at the, at the high level, and it's because the fees are high and uh, both sides generally know what they're doing. And so the broker is there to keep the deal on the tracks and they are very intense and they will like, you know, they're pushing on both ends, right? Because they only get paid if the deal gets, you know, is successful. So I had a gentleman, Dan, who's a physician, great guy. Uh, he had most of his money in the market and um, he, he and his wife kind of asked me to go for a coffee. We sat down, they said, we like this deal that you're, you have listed. I said, Dan, uh, as much as I'd like to sell you this, I, I frankly, I think that this is probably not the best one for you. I was just being straight with him. Uh, he said, okay, well, what would you recommend? And so I kind of started to uncover what it was that he was looking for. And he didn't want a second job. He just wanted really an asset that was going to pay him predictably. And so we went out, we found him an A property, newer, not a lot of value add, but in commercial real estate, re retail or industrial, you have what are triple net leases, which means the tenants pay 
you rent, plus they pay all your op costs, which would be your taxes, insurance, utilities, everything. He said, yeah, I, I like that. Uh, I like the sounds of that. We went out, took us about three, four months to find the right property. But that one property will essentially replace $300,000 of income when it's paid off. Okay. So in full transparency right now, he's getting kind of a, I don't know, like a, a mid uh, four figures a month, which is not enough to retire, but it's his first property. And it'd be the equivalent of say, I don't know, 40 homes, right? So if he right. owns 40 homes or he owns this one property and he has a pro professional property manager, he spends less than two hours a month. Uh, he owned an up down duplex where he had multiple tenants and it was just like, I'm getting out of these things, Shane. I want to, you know, focus more on the commercial side of things. So that yeah. was, that, that's, a, that's an example of someone that kind of moved into it. Didn't happen overnight. I'm not going to say there wasn't bumps in the road, but, uh, but he was committed. And, uh, and once he got clear on what he wanted in the location, um, you know, it didn't, it didn't take that long to really kind of find him a property that made sense. And I think just to kind of add here to in being in the residential space, I see there's, there's this race, everyone's running around. Where can I find the best cash flow? Where can I get yeah. the best cash flow? It wasn't until I experienced the commercial side, which is new to me, uh, and I'm right. growing in this space too, that I truly realized that cash flow doesn't exist in the residential space as it does in the commercial space. And until people recognize that, um, they're, they're going to keep running around. And I don't think that's ever going to change. It's a good start. And not to, to discount any of the residential purchases. I think people have done extremely well, but I, but I totally see what you're saying. I think if there's anything I'm getting out of the chat today, it's really commercial properties is synonymous with cash flow. And as someone who is looking to hopefully replace their income with cash flow, there's no better avenue to do that in, in, in a safe way than commercial real estate. So I, I love, I love the things you're doing. I love the things that you've said. I know there's going to be a lot of people that want to reach out to you, probably have questions, want to get to know a little bit more about some of the systems that you have. Can you share with us where folks can find you on social or online? Sure. I mean, um, the easiest is just my website, Shane Melanson, M E L A N S O N, uh, .com. Uh, from there you can, you know, find my podcast and my book. Uh, but I just want to make one comment that, that, uh, and touch on something commercial real estate is valued off its cash flow, right? That's right. And, and, and so um, when you buy residential, it's, you know, what did the house down the street sell for, right? It, it's generally not valued this or, or um, yeah, it's not valued the same way. It's valued on comparables versus a cap rate. And a cap rate is just really the multiple of what you're prepared to pay for the cash flow. So uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's typically why people will buy commercial real estate is for that, that cash flow, if you will. Um, and so when you add value to a property, retail, industrial, multifamily, you get that, uh, you know, when you add $100, it doesn't go up by $100, it goes up by the multiple, right? So it could go up by 20x or more um, of that that uh, increase. So anyways, just thought I would uh, touch on that because you, it was a really good point you made. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the other side to that too is qualifying because it's so property heavy. There's often ways you can get into commercial spaces. You can't touch in the residential space. Sometimes people are getting limited. I, I know chatting with folks that becomes the reason that they investigate, not that they're interested in the cash flow, but they realize, you know what, I'm stuck as it relates to residential, regardless of how much money I've got coming in. And, and so that forces their hand to start to learn it. And we probably have listeners that are in that category even now. So this has been a really great chat, Shane. I appreciate you taking the time. I encourage everybody to jump over to your podcast. What's your podcast called again? So that podcast is called the Investing Advantage Podcast. Fantastic. So yeah, guys, support Shane. If you could hit the like button, leave us a comment if you have any questions down below. Really appreciate you taking time to come join us today, Shane. You bet. I appreciate it. Thanks.